Hi, I'm Tim Slater from the Center for Astronomy and Physics Education Research. I wanted to spend some time talking with you about our experiences related to robotic telescope observing. So to give you a sense of the kinds of things we do when we do robotic telescope observing, I prepared a very brief video for you, um, but to give you some of the ideas of what's involved in robotic telescope observing. Robotic telescope observing really has come about because of the Internet. It's a relatively new phenomenon. Hasn't been too many years ago when many of us had to trudge up to an observatory in the middle of the night where it could be very, very cold and look through a very large telescope and look at the images of the kinds of things we could see in the sky. And to record those, we'd often have to draw pictures or use photographic film. And those of you that had darkroom experience know this is a very complicated process to go through. Today, telescope observing is really, really quite different. But nonetheless, it's still a really important part of astronomy. Now, part of the motivation for why we need to do a robotic telescope observing has to do just with the major distances and the travel that's involved in getting to telescopes. You can't put telescopes in the middle of a major urban city because the lights cause way too many problems for using the telescopes. So we have to go to very far away places, like out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii, or into um, South America in Chile or into the eastern Atlantic Ocean in the Canary Islands, places that are very, very hard to get to. They involve very long road trips to airports. They involve long walks through airports with luggage, often international airports, going through them in the middle of the night when you can't find a Starbucks or any place to get a cup of coffee. It involves flying very long hours on air, multiple if airplanes, because there's never a direct flight to any of these places. And we're not talking first class airlines either. We're talking about whatever the local um, airline company is to get there. There. And then once you arrive at this place, then there's usually a long bus ride or a long taxi ride um, up to the top of a very deserted mountaintop just to begin to do your astronomy. I have to tell you, that sounds much more romantic than it really is. It's just really, really exhausting work. I would myself would much rather do my astronomy like this. Do my astronomy from an armchair where I'm sitting with a comfortable cup of coffee or a glass of your favorite beverage served over ice where you can begin to contemplate the kind of work that's going on in astronomy and not actually have to be at one of these very remote locations. Of course, you don't have to do it from your living room. There are a number of different places. Um, Stephanie's favorite place to do her work from, of course, is from a cruise ship somewhere around the Pacific or running around the Mediterranean. Wherever you have a laptop and you have internet access, you can do world-class astronomy. So let me some examples of the kinds of things you can do. Um, one of the best places to go to get observing data is to NASA in the Microobservatory Project. The Microobservatory Project has telescopes located in Massachusetts, um, where it's often cloudy, and Arizona, where it's almost never cloudy. In fact, you can see here in the picture in the top panel in the middle section is a small telescope in Arizona. That's the typical telescope you use when you're using the microobservatory network. And it's very, very easy to use. Let me see if I can give you a sense of how this works. When you use one of these robotic telescopes, what you do is you use the, the computer interface to tell the telescope exactly what you want to look at. Many of these telescopes already have preset objects for you to look at, things that are very common for astronomers to go find information about. The moon and the planets, or the sun, or perhaps star clusters, perhaps uh, star-forming regions or clouds called nebula. Galaxies are also great things to look at when you're looking at looking through a tel through robotically controlled telescope. One that's far away from the city lights, one that's um, out in places where it's often very clear and doesn't rain, and places where you don't have to be. In this particular case, all you need to do is click on the particular thing you'd like to look at and um, submit a, a observation request. In this example, um, I picked the Hercules cluster because it's one of my favorite things to look at. And all you need to do is select the field of view. In other words, how big a piece of sky do you want to take a picture of? Um, how long do you want to leave the telescope open? Is it a fraction of a second? Is it a full second? Is it many seconds? And what kind of filters you'd like to? You want to look at it in particular color wavelengths? You want to just look at it coming at you in all colors. And in fact, when you go to the astronomy, the uh, NASA observatory network, and you say, I'd like to look at the Hercules cluster, and you submit your observation, what happens is you get a note back that says, hey, your request for an image has been submitted. And it's likely that we'll take that picture tonight. And in a couple of days, we'll send you an email that says, hey, here's the picture you got. Well, I have to tell you, that idea of it taking a couple of days, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. 
So often what I do is I don't just submit one request. Since I'm sitting out at the telescope or at my computer running the telescope, I'll submit a couple of requests. Um, so for example, the Whirlpool Galaxy is one of my all-time favorite things to look at. So with the Whirlpool Galaxy, um, what I'd like to do is to um, submit this, this request as well. Um, and when I do that, of course, I get another message back that says, in a few days, we'll send you an email telling you how to get your image. Part of you doing robotic astronomy means you have to do a lot of waiting. Sometimes that's waiting because you submit your observations in the daytime and you have to wait for nighttime to occur. Other times it's because you have to wait for clouds to pass over the telescope or you have to wait for other people who've made observations. Or sometimes you want to look at an object that only appears in the wintertime and you're doing your observations in the summertime. You may have to wait six months to make those observations. So sometimes I begin to think about, well, maybe I need to be careful what I'm looking at. If I'm submitting my observations in the daytime, why don't I just look at the sun? So in fact, um, what I did here with this telescope network is I set up a field of view. I set up how long I wanted the exposure to take. I set the filters so I could look at the sun. Because surely, right, the, the sun is up, surely I'd get an observation right back. As it turns out, no. When you look at the, uh, with the page you get back, it tells us that the observatory only takes pictures of the sun once or twice every week. Um, so again, this is an exercise in patience and learning how to be patient when you're doing astronomy because it really sometimes takes a very long time and there's a lot of waiting that's involved. Turns out you don't have to just wait on your observations. Things like the uh, the micro observatory network, they take t take images every clear night, and you can go and look and see what kind of pictures were taken last night, or what kind of pictures were taken last week, or what all pictures were were taken on your birthday or on your spouse's birthday. And so there's a lot of access you can get, but actually getting your particular image you want, you often do have to wait. Now, not all telescopes are like this. Some telescopes, you, when you control, you can actually control them in what we call, say, real time. In other words, you can point the telescope and tell it exactly what you want. Um, that brings us to an important difference in the kind of telescope observing we're talking about. There are generally two kinds. They're what we call robotic telescopes, and they're what we call remotely controlled telescopes. Robotically controlled telescopes are telescopes that work like a robot. You give it a program, you tell it what to do, and in a point in time, it'll turn to the point in the sky, it'll take the image that you want taken, it'll take the image that you want taken, and it will um, then send you back the information. That's different than a remotely controlled telescope. A remotely controlled telescope is a telescope in which you sit at, the, at your laptop and you control that telescope via the internet. And maybe it's anywhere all over the world. It could be in Australia, it could be in South America, or it could be in, um, in, in Tenerife, for that matter. In fact, one of the telescopes that I spend a lot of time using is called the SLU telescope. And the SLU telescope has, has locations in the Canary Islands as well as locations um, in S South America and Australia. Um, one of my, favorite, picture, one of my favorite, favorite objects to look at is a galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars um, together um, that are isolated from other stars in space. And here's an image that I've taken using the remote control telescope, which works in real time in the Canary Islands. And I did this while sitting at my, my desk in my office. So the telescope called SLU, which is one you can operate in real time, is really useful um, when you know something specific is going on at a particular time. Uh, recently, um, I spent some time observing a solar eclipse uh, using SLU.com. And the SLU telescopes were set up in Japan and in California. Um, now, telescopes don't, uh, sorry, telescopes happen all the time, but eclipses don't happen all the time. Eclipses are relatively rare events. In fact, here's a map of the places that eclipses are occurring. An eclipse will only occur in one location about once every 18 years. So people often have to travel to go see eclipses. Um, I've seen eclipses um, both in the United States and in Africa. Um, Stephanie's seen eclipses throughout the Caribbean and throughout the southern part of the United States. Um, they don't happen all the time. And it's pretty expensive to go visit one of these uh, eclipses. However, if you have a remotely controlled telescope there, you can do observing of these eclipses. Um, the most recent one, um, as of this op video I'm making for you, was on May 20th, um, which occurred right over Japan, over the northern part of the Atlantic, and over the western part of the United States. So SLU.com telescopes were set up to be remotely controlled from remotely controlled from uh, both Japan and from California. 
Um, and this was important because the tel although the eclipse was visible in Wyoming, um, you can see from this weather map that there's a, most of the western United States was very clear, except a little tiny strip running from just north of Albuquerque, New Mexico, up through um, the middle of Wyoming. And you see that little layer, long line, line of clouds was directly overhead where I happened to be sitting. So fortunately, I did have an opportunity to use a remotely controlled telescope. Um, so here's an image taken from Japan. This was um, an image right before totality occurred, um, right before the moon got directly between the moon uh, and the moon got directly between the Earth um, and the sun. You can see how it's how it's covered up. Um, and so I was very excited about this because here I am in the United States watching an eclipse that was only viewable from Japan at that moment. Now, what was particularly interesting is the moon got ever so closer to being directly between us and the sun, covering up the sun. The clouds started to roll in, and you can see some images here from Mount Fiji, and images here from from Tokyo, where the clouds were rolling in. Um, here's yet another image. Just as we almost got perfectly to totality, the clouds began to roll in. In fact, uh, the clouds got thicker and thicker as the seconds got closer and closer. And right when we reached totality, um, rain started in, and we completely were unable to see um, this eclipse that occurred there. But I wasn't worried because I hadn't spent all that money and time and effort to go to Japan. I knew we also had telescopes set up in California. So here's an image from, from California. The one on the left is um, what the sun is the image of the sun. You can see the moon starting to creep across it. On the right hand side here is an image from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is farther east of California, which means that it takes longer for the moon shadow that's falling on the Earth to move across the Earth. So the eclipse will happen first in California, and then later it will happen in um, in, in Albuquerque. And again, if you look at the clouds here, California was clear, Albuquerque was clear, Colorado and Wyoming, not quite so clear. So again, um, not being able to travel um, very easily makes remote control telescopes a very important thing to have. So one of the things particularly interesting here um, is if you look when we see totality in California, um, we've not yet seen totality here in Albuquerque because the shadow has not quite gotten to Albuquerque. And of course, once the shadow does get to Albuquerque on the right-hand side there, when, it's direct, when the moon is directly between the Earth and the sun, in California, it's over. It's now past with that. So remote control telescopes can allow you to do not just um, things you can't do by traveling, it also lets you look at an object or a phenomena um, at exactly the same time from different places on the Earth, which allows you to see different things. Um, also, people from all over the world can take pictures of the eclipses, and they can put them in a central repository. Wikipedia serves as a great repository, and these are pictures from all over the world of the eclipse that people just uploaded to Wikipedia. Um, but again, looking, um, here's my son Maxwell trying to see the eclipse um, from Wyoming. Um, there was no chance. The clouds were just, just too much. Um, however, although um, they couldn't quite look through the clouds to see it, there were images of the eclipse that did happen in terms of shadows. And you can see under his left arm here uh, the semicircle um, image of the eclipse that was visible on his shirt, but not through the telescopes we were using. Well. We don't have to use telescopes that are located outside of Wyoming. There are also telescopes in Wyoming. We um, have partnered with a group in Sheridan, Wyoming, called the Sky Titan Collaborative to create telescopes that we can use with, with students in particular. I um, wanted to share some of my experiences with them. We use Illuminate, just like we are right now, to be able to, to do this. What happens is we can put up a star map, and um, the telescope operator, his name is Scott Mecca in this picture, he's on the left-hand side there, um, is sitting at the telescope. But through Illuminate, you can share control and actually give you, the user, a chance to point the telescope. So here's a star map. Um, that what happens is you take the mouse and you click on exactly what you'd like the telescope to focus in on, um, and that's uh, all that's involved with driving the telescope. Um, here's a picture of one of my favorite um, galaxies called M51. Um, Absolutely beautiful picture here of this galaxy. You can see me. Um, I wasn't the only person there besides the telescope operator. Um, my buddy David McKinnon was there. David McKinnon was in Australia um, at this time. And you can see, um, although it was dark where I was, it's very light and bright sunny day, almost noontime um, there in, in, uh, in, uh, in Australia. Um, in fact, he had to quit observing um, with us because he had to go to lunch at one point. Um, you don't just have to look at galaxies. We can also look at star clusters. Here's a picture I've taken of M13, a globular cluster of 100,000 stars right at the edge of our own galaxy. 
Uh, here's another image um, that I've taken with the, the uh, Sky Titan telescope. Uh, this telescope, again, is one you operate in real time by, um, by pointing and clicking. This is a picture of the Ring Nebula. This is a place where you have a star that's run out of fuel, and it's ejected its outer layers to make a giant ring um, around the star. And this is a, the Ring Nebula is one of my favorite things to look at. So again, as, as we're talking about here, Understanding the nature between remote control telescopes and robotic telescopes really gives us a lot of advantages. It can be the kind of thing that can be done through your armchair, it can be done in front of your school classroom, you don't have to you know, charter a bus or charter an entire plane to fly your students all the way to Hawaii to do these observations. You can do them from right in your own, own location.